Chris Lehane, the democratic solution for this is to put a price on carbon pollution through cap and trade or maybe a carbon tax. And the reality is that energy prices will go up in that case. Well, first of all, I probably fall into the category that Steve described as the other extreme. Um, and, and I'll just jump in and, and again, with all respect to Steve, I think we're already paying a lot of those economic consequences. I mean, we talked about uh, the impact that climate has had on all sorts of different areas of our economy. Uh, but it's also having a huge impact on our health. Uh, you know, it's having a huge impact around the world just on issues in, involving people's safety. So you know, all those things are already taking place, and they're also taking place in a context of where there is an enormous subsidization already of the fossil fuel industry. So I mean, just to be clear, right, some of this stuff is we already are suffering consequences. Those consequences are being borne by everyone in society, and you have an industry that already is being subsidized at a significant level. Um, so what is, what is the answer from, 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 the, from the democratic side or the progressive side? Look, I think there are a variety of ways to look at this. First of all, I don't think it is a zero-sum game where um, you know, costs go up if you decide to do this. I mean, the reality <coughs> is if you, if you sort of take it into account all the costs that are taking place already, there's a pretty compelling argument that, in fact, costs go down in terms of what everyone's paying and what individuals pay. Uh, secondly, there's no question that there's going to be a clean tech economy. That is already happening. Now, the real question is, are those jobs going to be here or are they going to be overseas? And I guess my perspective is I'd much rather have those jobs here, particularly if we do the right policies. I was involved in, you referenced it earlier on Prop 39, which was an effort to close uh, a loophole that existed um, in California and use the funds uh, to support uh, clean tech. And those funds are specifically going to be used to do retrofits of schools all across the state, I mean, that will create in and of itself, and if I'm remembering this correctly, uh, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 50,000 jobs, uh, you know, long-term jobs to, to retrofit schools all across the state. Now, those are jobs that are going to be here. That is a policy that we're putting in place that's not going to have an economic impact other than the following. It puts a lot of people to work. It's going to save enormous amount of energy bills for public schools that then get plowed into classrooms and back to the students. And at the end of the day, the larger societal uh, implications are pretty significant in terms of what it's doing to the quality of the air. Steve, let's have uh, your comment on the subsidization of fossil fuels and there are costs that are being paid, but borne by society and consumers today. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> when you had mentioned I worked for Dick Cheney at the beginning of the program, I remember <clears throat> once before I say what I'm about to say here, <laughs> I remember once being in the limo with Dick Cheney coming through San Francisco, I looked out and I said, sir, look, everyone's waving at you. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I think when you look at, when you look at if we're, if we're going to term the oil companies, energy companies, um, the fossil fuel economy, fossil fuel economy, the energy companies have lifted more people out of poverty into the middle class creating economic growth worldwide more than any other industry in the history of the world ever. Our entire world is driven by the energy produced by these companies. And I think so many of these companies are vilified and vilified by politicians. Big energy companies, Chevron in California. Is California better off with having Chevron located in it? I think the answer is absolutely, of course it is. Um, these are companies that operate in places as remote as the moon, uh, high technology companies employing hundreds of thousands of people, scientists, engineers, um, and they are able to extract the resources used to power our world overwhelmingly, uh, safely, um, without incident. Of course, there are accidents and there are incidents, um, but the notion that in the short term, uh, we're going to be able to eliminate our dependence on oil, on, on natural gas, and other fossil fuels, I think is fantastical. I think that we should have an all-of-the-above approach, but when it comes to... I've heard that for sure somewhere. <laughs> when it comes to, when it comes to, um, when it comes to approving things like the Keystone Pipeline, uh, it makes no sense to me that we would allow a pipeline to be built to send fuel uh, energy to Asia but not allow it to come south to the United States. And clearly, in my view, um, getting energy from Canada is better than the alternative of importing energy, for example, from the Middle East, um, where there are significant consequences from, from doing that. So um, I do believe that government has a role in research. 
uh, and funding research and, and driving advancement, but should the government be in the business of picking winners or losers, being in the venture capital business per se? I I'm skeptical that over the long run that that's the right way to drive growth in this industry. Chris Lane? Yeah, a, a couple of things. You know, first of all, and again, good friends here, so we're going to, I think, first of all, I'm playing to a home crowd here, which I think gives me a little bit of an advantage, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> and, and Steve gets great courage points for showing up at this particular forum. Um, but first of all, right, if you talk about in, industrial policy, which is, I think, what you're sort of indicating, winners and losers, that's, that's happening right now with the fossil fuels. I mean, you are picking winners and losers uh, through the level of subsidizations that take place. Second of all, we have something called Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley was created in no small part because of DARPA a military-funded program that was effectively picking winners and losers. The aerospace industry in California was, divide, was basically funded by the federal government, which picked winners and losers in that context. So we have a government that over time has a record of picking winners and losers. And then when you get the keystone, the keystone argument to me makes a lot more sense if, if what you said is accurate. I think the challenge is it's not necessarily the case. I mean, what we've now learned are two things. First of all, the keys to TransCanada, the company that owns Keystone, in fact, is not going to have the oil shipped through a pipeline and then delivered to U.S. auto drivers. What they're going to do is ship it through the pipeline to refineries in the Gulf Coast and then ship it to Asia and in particular to China so they can have cheap energy to make cheap goods that they dump back into the U.S. and we lose jobs at the end of the day. Uh, I mean, TransCanada themselves have acknowledged that they cannot commit to this gas going to the United States. They've been pushed on that any number of times and they refuse to ag agree that they'll put the, the oil here. The reality is, is that it actually cost them more if they put it on trains and shipped it to the western side of Canada, refined it there, and then sent it on ships. What they want to do is send it on the pipeline so they can actually have a cheap source and increase their profits. Secondly, the amount of jobs that are created, look, at jobs are incredibly important. We all agree that. There will be jobs, some jobs created in terms of the actual construction of the pipeline, but TransCanada's own folks have acknowledged that it's only going to create 35 permanent jobs. So you're talking 35 permanent jobs that send oil to China to make cheap goods to hire more people in China, and we end up losing jobs here. I just don't think that makes a lot of sense. Well, Steve Schmidt. Uh, well, look, all of, the, all of the oil that would come out of the Canadian tar stands, mm -hmm. you know, whether it ultimately winds up in Asian markets, whether it winds up in a domestic U.S. market, do we want to have, and it would be thousands of jobs building the pipeline, um, and I'm aware of the statistic on the, you know, the 35, you know, the, with the permanent jobs. But the amount of economic activity that will come from the construction of the pipeline. And our market, of course, when we import oil, where it goes into an American refinery, you know, where it winds up. I mean, part of the rhetoric around, you know, that we're going to be energy independent, right? That all of the oil that comes into the country or all of the oil that we... Uh, that we mine in U.S. territorial, that, that we exploit in U.S. territorial waters, you know, some of that is imported, excuse me, some of that is exported, you know, some of it stays, you know, domestically. But I think when you look at all of these issues, um, we want to have safe drilling um, off the coast. Um, I don't want to do it off of Santa Barbara. I don't want to do it off of off Monterey. But we need to be able to, I think, extract resources, um, whether they be natural gas, Fracking is going to be a huge issue of debate that takes place over the next decade, and I think it's very important. Um, and you look at some of the economic activity that's going to come, you know, from fracking in some places that are that are that are very, um, you know, that are in very tough economic times in Upper New York State, where you've had a job mm -hmm. deficit you know, for a very long time. You look at the economic boom in in North Dakota, for example. So there's huge economic impacts around our ability to exploit our natural resources and there always has been and so my point is is that we should have we should have balance and the quest the point that you're making on on um, you know the government picking winners and losers you know through the tax code which they which they certainly do and you know I agree completely completely that we should have fundamental tax reform in the country and the government should largely get out of the business through the tax code of subsidizing some companies, penalizing other companies. We have the most uncompetitive tax code of any major economy in the world by a lot. And so, you know, I'm someone who, when you look at subsidies to various industries, various industry sectors, including the energy sector, including the agriculture sector, including the sugar industry, for example, we should take a look at 
we should take a look at all of this. But when you look at government research, whether it was you know, ultimately in a DARPA that fueled the Internet, whether it was through the space program, which had enormous applications into the domestic computing market, you know, and of course, so much of our technology today came through defense spending, mm -hmm. you know, and innovations there. So I think government spending does drive innovation. Um, but I think that, you know, the government giving direct cash grants to different companies, you know, in the form of, a, of, of almost venture capital, again, I'm just, I'm just skeptical that that's the most effective way for, for government to spend <clears throat> taxpayer dollars on this stuff.